I've spent years dreaming about growing my own herbs and vegetables. Until recently, I was a renter and every attempt I made resulted in only a collection of pots containing dirt and broken dreams. Recently though, my wife and I bought our first house and it came with a beautifully maintained decorative garden surrounding this outdoor entertainment area. We called it the Granny Garden. This garden and undercover area was a significant factor in our decision to put an offer on this place. And as soon as our offer was accepted, all those dreams of easily accessible and abundant fresh herbs and vegetables came flooding back to me. So with lofty ambitions and unrealistic expectations, Britt and I have set off on a quest to build ourselves the herb garden of our dreams. I'm not gonna go into any of the soil prep, fertilizer or plant choices in these videos. There are far better resources for that on YouTube or elsewhere online. I also have no idea what any of that actually means. What I will do though is share some of the tech automations and custom solutions I'll be using to make this garden and others to come as fertile, functional, and low maintenance as possible. Success for this particular part of our garden would be Brit and I no longer needing to purchase these sleeves of herbs from the local supermarket or grocer. I sat down and did the math a couple of weeks ago, and if we bought two herb sleeves a week, we'd be spending nearly $350 a year just on fresh herbs. And usually we struggle to use it all before they get all sad and have to go in the bin. Before we can plant the herb garden though, we need to prepare the soil, which will take a few weeks. I started looking into purchasing all the seedlings we need, and when my Bunnings cart crossed $500, I figured there had to be a better way. It turns out most plants grow from seeds, which is fantastic. You can just buy the seeds you need, throw them in the ground, and Bob's your aunt's husband. While this is true for a lot of herbs, it's not quite that simple for some of the other plants we'd like to grow. As white Australians, we love to pretend we know how to cook Mexican and Asian dishes at home, and as a result, we use a lot of chilies in particular. They often take a while to sprout, uh, germinate, I don't know, be born, and also need really warm soil, about 30 degrees Celsius, or 80 of those bizarre American F units. While Australia is generally a very warm country, with summer temperatures often exceeding 40 degrees Celsius, we live in Victoria, where it's often 40 degrees and 14 degrees in the same week. As a result, we can't rely on the giant nuclear reactor in the sky to keep the soil warm enough for long enough to kick off the lives of our hopefully fruitful danger capsicums. So we've opted to put together this miniature greenhouse to act as a nursery for our little chili babies. This will help keep the soil warm and encourage growth until they're large and hardy enough to be planted in the herb garden proper. Once I realized there were numbers involved in growing chilies, my innate desire to log data and optimize everything took over. In a flurry of lack of self-control and AliExpress and Amazon orders, I had everything I needed to build a smart greenhouse. Here's the plan. We need to keep the soil in our seedling trays and pots as close to 30 degrees as we can. We also need to try and maintain humidity of at least 30% inside the greenhouse. To achieve this, we obviously need a way to control the temperature and humidity. Firstly, I'm gonna use a fan at the top of the greenhouse. This will draw out excess hot air and humidity when it's turned on. To add heat, so the little fiery fellas keep thriving on cold Victorian days, I'm using these cheap seedling heaters. They're only 20 watts, so won't blow up the power bill too much, and they're waterproof. To add humidity, I'm using a cheap irrigation hose and misters system. Our greenhouse kit actually came with some of these plumbing bits, but I opted to overdo it and added some more misters and bits from Bunnings. This is absolutely not necessary. I'm using this solenoid valve, which is a few bucks on Amazon, to turn the water on and off. To drive these, I've got one of these handy little ESP32 based boards with four relays to switch devices on and off when needed using Home Assistant. This particular one can be mains powered, which is super handy for applications like this. To measure soil temperature, I'm gonna hook a handful of these little DS18B20 temperature probes up to some spare IO pins on my ESP32 board and stick them in the seed trays to track soil temperature. To measure the humidity and air temperature, I'm using one of these DHT22 humidity and temperature sensors. These are cheap as chips and work perfectly with ESP Home. I made a little 3D printed case for it and potted the whole thing with epoxy so the little PCB survives the high humidity environment. 
All the electronics are going inside one of these weatherproof enclosures to ensure they keep working out in the rain. I think that's everything we need, so let's put it together. The first step was putting together the greenhouse itself. This is a pretty standard cheap mini greenhouse from the giant green hardware store. I did some extra work to make the plumbing nice and neat for our misters though. Next, I created a fan mount for the exhaust fan infusion and printed it in the same baby blue ABS filament I've been trying to use up for months. The fan mount snaps onto the frame and is held in place with some zip ties. I cut a hole in the plastic greenhouse cover with a sharp knife and screwed the fan into place through the plastic. I also made a louvered grill for the fan to keep rain out. Next up was our electronics. These boxes are great. They're waterproof and really solid enclosures for outdoor projects. Most of them have these trays in the base held in with a few screws. You can mount all of your electronics to the tray, wire it all up, get it all working, then drop it back into the enclosure and screw it back in. Combined with some weatherproof cable glands, we can keep our electronics nice and dry out in the weather. First up, I needed to mount the ESP relay board to the tray with some standoffs. But before installing it for good, I needed to solder on all of my sensor wires. The temperature probes can all share one data pin. Each one has its own address and can be read separately. They also require a pull-up resistor to allow the ESP to read them. I used this little piece of strip board to solder all the temperature probes to the data, 3.3 volt and ground pins and to install the pull-up resistor. I'm using one relay for the fan, one each for the heating mats and the last one for the water solenoid valve. The solenoid runs on 12 volt DC so I used this little downlight transformer to drop the voltage. I'm using these waterproof connectors for the heating pads, solenoid and the fan. Everything else is just hardwired into the box through a gland. I put the tray back into the electronics enclosure, passed through all the cables and got it all wired up. I made sure to get everything configured and working in ESP Home in the garage where it's a little easier to troubleshoot before installing it next to the greenhouse. I definitely didn't spend two days troubleshooting only to discover about half the cheap sensors I bought weren't working at all. Buy your sensors from reputable dealers don't make the same mistake. If you're not familiar with ESP Home, it's an open source project that allows you to use low cost ESP microcontrollers with Home Assistant really easily. You can build your own IoT devices so easily and cheaply, you'll begin to find ways to use them everywhere. Take it from me. I won't take you through how to use ESP Home from square one. There are plenty of resources online to teach you that. Even ChatGPT would do a really good job of teaching you on a project. Once my new control box is all hooked up to Home Assistant, you can see we have our temperatures and switches for the fan and the misters. Now you could just expose all of these things to Home Assistant and build the automations there, but I built them in ESP Home instead. It's just a little cleaner in my mind. I'll do my best to keep the explanations simple and as always I'll include the YAML in a post on my website so you can replicate this project for yourself. We're using an Atom 4 channel relay board that's only about 20 bucks online to drive this whole thing and it comes pre-installed with ESP Home. I'll just get that a little closer for you. Oh, uh, that reminds me. Big thanks to today's video sponsor, FlexiSpot. I've been using standing desks in my office for years now and honestly, I couldn't go back. So when FlexiSpot got in touch and offered to send me their E7 Plus standing desk for the workshop, I couldn't say no. And I've got to say, I'm impressed. This thing is really solid. If you've watched a few of my videos, you've probably noticed the wobbly workbench. Well, not anymore. This four leg frame has completely solved that and made shooting workbench scenes so much easier. Even compared to the two leg standing desk in my office, which is fine, but wobbles a bit with the wide desktop and monitors, the E7 Plus is worlds better. Honestly, I'm tempted to grab a second one for my office. It can handle over 200 kilos or 500 pounds, goes all the way up to 1300 millimeters or about 51 inches tall, and even has a handy USB charger built right into the controls. 
which has been perfect for testing some of my USB powered projects like the Everything Remote. I've also found the adjustable height super useful for garage projects. Being able to raise or lower it for close up work or larger projects makes a huge difference and has saved my back a world of pain. FlexiSpot backs it with a 15 year warranty and a 30 day return policy. So if you're not happy, you can get your money back really easily. And it's way more affordable than most four leg desks out there. You can find out more about the E7 Plus at the link in the description. And right now, FlexiSpot's running a special sales event with up to 65% off. If you use my code and tell them I sent you, you'll get an extra $50 off on top of that. Big thanks again to FlexiSpot for supporting this video. The ESP relay board is the center of this project. The relays are connected to the fan, the water solenoid via a 12 volt transformer, and to the heat mats. The relay board has some extra pads on the board that will allow us to connect other peripherals like sensors to the ESP microcontroller itself. In my case, we have our humidity and air temperature sensor and our two temperature probes connected to some of these spare pins. In ESP Home, we have the heat mats and their corresponding temperature probes set up as a thermostat. This should help us keep our soil temp as close to the optimum temperature as possible. We have another thermostat in ESP Home that manages the air temperature. If the temperature gets very high, above 50 degrees Celsius or so, it'll run to bring the air temperature down a little. If the humidity is more than 20% above or below the desired number for more than 30 minutes, it uses either the fan or the misters to bring it back into the desired window. I have a simple automation in Home Assistant that runs the misters for a little while each day to make sure the soil moisture level doesn't drop too low as well. All of this is configurable via Home Assistant. You can set the desired humidity, desired soil temperatures, and how long the misters should run when the humidity drops. In theory, this means the perfect artificial conditions for growing our spicy seedlings, or any other seedlings for that matter. I set up the greenhouse for a couple days to test it out before adding any seeds or anything. I made this little dashboard in Home Assistant to make it easy to monitor, and it stayed within parameters except overnight where the heat mats couldn't keep up. I popped in a couple of pots with some coriander and basil seeds just to test how well the temperature probes worked when in soil instead of free air, and they worked beautifully, keeping the soil inside our desired temperature window really easily. I suspect the lack of any thermal mass inside the greenhouse means that the temperature is fluctuating a lot faster than if it were filled with potting soil and seedlings. We're planting a whole bunch of different chilies, so we took note of which types went where and planted them in the seed trays and starter pots. As far as I can tell, everything's going well. The extra thermal mass that we've put in there now seems to have helped with the temperature fluctuations quite a lot. Now, some of these seeds take a really long time to germinate, so we won't know how successful we've been for a little while, but I'll be sure to make another video to update you when it comes time to plant them. Whoa, 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 whoa. Future Dylan stepping in here, this video got pushed down my schedule a bit, so we've actually had the plants growing in the greenhouse for a few weeks now. Unfortunately, my procrastination means we got things planted much later than I'd hoped, and we're relying pretty heavily on the heat mats to keep temperatures up inside the greenhouse. I was very excited to see things start growing. Some of them seemed to be really taking off and they look great, and the greenhouse seemed to be working perfectly, until we had a bit of a storm and I didn't have nearly enough weight in the bottom of the greenhouse and it led to disaster. In a panic, I repotted what I could save and now I am left with this. It's not all lost, everything is still growing, there's just a lot less of it now. Anyway, enough of my misery, back to past me. So, what do you think? What'd I miss? I have no idea how gardening really works, so let me know if you have any advice or suggestions down below. I could use all the help I could get. Does this project make sense? 
absolutely not. It's totally unnecessary. With about 10 minutes a day, you could probably get fine results, but it's cool and I wanna do it and I'll learn something along the way. So for me, worth it. For you, maybe not so much. We've got a lot more gardening adjacent projects on the way, including a home assistant based irrigation system with fertilizer dosing and a 3D printed garden lighting system. But if you're not into projects of the outside variety, there are a bunch of smart home automation projects based indoors coming soon as well. Hit the subscribe button if that sounds like something you're interested in so you don't miss them. Thanks heaps for watching. I appreciate you. Catch you next time.